Hello there, this is Dhiru Munduluru and welcome back. Now let's get started with virtual threads and let's do a deep dive into them. So we will try to get a very clear understanding of how virtual threads work and how they enable in achieving higher concurrency and help us in building highly scalable concurrent applications. There are multiple contributing factors for this and we are going to discuss all of them in a very clear way. We will also discuss the scenario where virtual threads are most beneficial. Our demos will be part of subsequent lectures. So in this particular lecture, our goal is to get a clear understanding of how they work. So it's going to be a very interesting lecture. So let's go ahead and get started. So in the last lecture, we discussed about the limitations of platform threads and we said that to build highly scalable concurrent applications, we should be able to create a large number of threads so that we can handle large number of concurrent tasks. And we also said that the OS threads should not be blocked during blocking operations like a blocking IO operation or a sleep operation. For example, when we are downloading a web page, the OS thread should not be blocked. And we said that virtual threads are the solution for that. Virtual threads were developed as part of Project Loom and they were released as a permanent feature in Java 21 after being in preview mode in the prior two releases in Java 19 and Java 20. They are a major enhancement of Java and they help in achieving higher throughput. So virtual threads, as the name suggests, are virtual. So they are not real threads like the OS threads. And they are simple, lightweight Java objects, but they are still instances of the java.lang.thread class. Now we know that the thread class represents platform threads, which are simple wrappers around OS threads. That is, we know that there is a OS thread is tied to the platform thread or the platform thread is tied to OS thread. So there is a one-to-one -one correspondence there. So from Java 21 onwards, the thread class can be used to create either a platform thread or a virtual thread. So the class has acquired some new methods to create virtual threads. But the thing to note is, unlike platform threads, virtual threads are not tied to OS threads. Okay, so that's why they are lightweight Java objects. And since they are instances of the thread class, we can refer to them as lightweight threads. Now, for every request or concurrent task, a new virtual thread will be created. So the application code that runs for a request or a task will now run inside a virtual thread. So we are still following the thread per request handling style because we are creating a dedicated virtual thread to handle a request. And since these are lightweight threads, we can create large number of virtual threads to handle equal number of concurrent tasks. Okay, so that's how we are addressing the first goal. So we can create large number of virtual threads. Okay, so they are very cheap to create. And since they are very cheap to create, we should never pool them. So always keep in mind that we should never pool virtual threads, all right? And the second goal is yet to be achieved. So we need more magic from virtual threads. But the thing is, the virtual threads cannot operate independently. They still need OS threads, that is the kernel threads, because OS threads are the ones that are scheduled to use the CPU cores. And the OS threads will still be wrapped in a platform thread. So platform threads will still be there. But the thing is, the first time that we are going to create a virtual thread, after our application starts, like after JVM starts, when we are creating the first virtual thread, at that instance, a small pool of platform threads would be created. And these platform threads will be used by all of the virtual threads. Now here, the pool size will generally be equal to the number of CPU cores. So if you have, let's say 16 cores, mostly you will have only 16 platform threads. But if you compare this with something like a fixed thread pool, there we typically have large number of platform threads in the thread pool, maybe in the order of hundreds, like 100 or 500, depending upon our need. So here the pool size is small. 
So here the virtual thread is going to use a platform thread and this assignment of platform thread to a virtual thread is done by a JVM scheduler. So we now have a JVM scheduler that schedules these virtual threads onto these platform threads. And the OS threads will still be scheduled using the OS scheduler. So here the virtual thread is using a platform thread whenever it needs some CPU time or it needs to perform some CPU operations. And at that point, when it is scheduled to use this platform thread, we refer to this process as mounting a virtual thread onto a platform thread. And the platform thread would be referred to as a carrier thread now. So because it is sort of carrying the virtual thread, because virtual thread needs some CPU time so that it can perform some CPU operations. Now, during the course of those computations, if there are any blocking operations, then the virtual thread will be suspended and the carrier thread will be released so that it can be mounted with a different virtual thread. Okay, This process of releasing the virtual thread is referred to as unmounting the virtual thread or we can also say that the virtual thread is parked. Okay? But once the blocking operation is completed, the released or the unmounted virtual thread will be mounted onto a, onto a carrier thread. And this carrier thread can be different from the earlier carrier thread. And now we say that the parked virtual thread is now unparked. Okay. So as we can see, the carrier thread is being shared across virtual threads when there are blocking operations. Okay, so the, the platform thread is no longer being locked or blocked for the entire duration of the blocking operation. And that's how we are addressing the second goal. Okay, so there is no blocking of OS threads here. Okay, so that's how they are smartly handling it. But if there are no blocking operations, then the mounted virtual thread will use that carrier thread for the entire lifetime of the request. Okay, it's only when there is some blocking operation, then it will be unmounted and it may be remount and it would be remounted later on. Okay. So as we can see, the JVM scheduler here is scheduling these large number of virtual threads onto this small pool of platform threads. And this pool is also a different pool from the traditional uh, fixed thread pool and we can discuss it later on. And if there are any blocking operations, then the virtual, th then the carrier thread will be shared across different virtual threads. Now, the difference from the fixed thread pool is that here we can create large number of virtual threads because they are very cheap to create and the pool size is also small here and the platform threads are, are also shared so they are no longer blocked so that's another difference whereas in uh, a fixed thread pool we would be creating a large number of platform threads uh, like 100 or 200 but we can only handle those many concurrent requests. But if, when it comes to virtual threads, since we can create unlimited number of virtual threads, we can handle equal number of concurrent tasks. Okay, so the concurrency is also increased dramatically. And another thing with fixed thread pool is they will be using a lot of stack memory too, right? Because if you're creating 500 platform threads, then each of them will require a stack and that stack size can be uh, something like one megabyte. So you are using a lot of stack memory too. But here we are using fewer platform threads. Okay, Generally, it's equal to the number of CPU cores, but that number can also be adjusted using a VM flag. So that's the difference between those two uh, thread pools, this thread pool and the fixed thread pool. Okay, so just to summarize, okay, if the virtual thread needs a CPU time, then it would be mounted onto a carrier thread. But if it encounters a, some blocking operation, then will, it will be unmounted and the carrier thread will be freed so that it can be mounted with a different virtual thread. But this unmounted virtual thread, once it is done with the blocking operation, then the scheduler will remount it onto your carrier thread and that carrier thread can be a different carrier thread too. Okay, from the different from the first one on which it was mounted. So that's how it works. But here there's a very important question, interesting question that we need to ask. 
how does during the remounting process how does jvm resume the execution uh, exactly at the same instance when it was unmounted okay so how does jvm continue its execution so the methods that were executing or uh, that were on the stack at the time of unmounting should also be there when it is remounted okay so how is jvm going to handle that and that we will see in a subsequent lecture and the next thing is to see when virtual threads are most beneficial if the need is we need to handle large number of concurrent tasks then we can create large number of virtual threads so if there is a need for high concurrency then we would be using virtual threads and if there are many blocking operations like a blocking iwo like downloading a web page or a sleep operation then we will be using virtual threads virtual threads will be beneficial and a typical scenario would be for web applications because typically web applications receive lots of concurrent requests and many of those requests are blocking operation like for example accessing a remote api okay a remote api like a microservice or downloading a web page all of those are blocking operations and that's where virtual threads will be very helpful but virtual threads are not helpful you know if we are dealing with an application that is not iwo heavy which means that there are not many blocking operations so in that case we don't have the os threads need not you know wouldn't be blocked so here they would be needing the cpu resources so they are cpu intensive applications and their virtual threads may not provide that much of benefit over something like a fixed thread pool an example would be matrix multiplication where we are constantly performing computations and there is no need for any blocking operations so in such a scenario platform uh, virtual threads may not be that helpful okay so that's the thing so virtual threads are not faster threads they just enable uh, with scalability they help with scalability when there are many blocking operations all right so if you are building a web application then you would want to consider using uh using uh, to, you would want to consider to use virtual threads so spring boot for instance can be configured to use uh virtual threads so that's also possible all right that's about it thank you and i hope you enjoyed learning about virtual threads see you in the next lecture